They often say it doesn't take a rocket scientist, but what if it does? What does it take to make a career in launching vehicles into outer space? Arrow Astro professor Carrie Cowhoy of MIT tells her story about how she got started and what she finds most exciting. So I was working in college and um, I was there on um, federal work study. So I, I, you know, had to get funding to go to college and didn't didn't have another way to do it. Um, and so I'd been working in the libraries and I saw this advertisement um, for somebody needed an undergrad researcher to help with a Mars rover program. And that turned out to be Professor Steve Squires at Cornell, who ended up launching the, the Mars rovers. So I started interning with him and um, was working on Mars rovers with Steve Squires for a while. And then um, I was in electrical engineering and got into satellites, went to grad school in that. So that's kind of how I got involved. It, was, it seemed like a cooler job. I love being in the library, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm definitely a bookworm. My first book, my, I'm a bookworm and my first word was book, but like, <laughs> but the rovers were, were a lot of fun. But, but you love this. You love satellites. Why? It is challenging. Um, it is one of the most mentally challenging, toughest fields I've ever been in because when it breaks, it is gone. And it is really hard um, to obtain funding, get funding to do it, get the hardware built, have it working, get it to the rocket, have it to survive the rocket launch, get up to orbit, and then you're able to do things and get perspectives that really there's no other way to do it. And you're also able to answer science questions um, like for astronomers and astrophysicists or people who are doing remote sensing on Earth that you can't get that data any other way. Um, so that, and that part's really rewarding. Watching a rocket launch is worth a good five years of working your butt off, I would say. Like, if I had to give the trade, like, just having a rocket launch, feeling the blast, and watching, knowing that, you know, your spacecraft is on there, and then you have to run back and make sure it works, but, like, that it's on there and it's going up is, like, one of the coolest feelings ever. So there's a lot of joy and pride and um, skill building and challenge and, in, in the field. So that, that's one of the reasons why, why, I, why I love it, even though it's really frustrating a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, as you do your work here at MIT, can you see what the next big thing is likely to be? Um, it's, it's exciting. You, you never know what the next big thing is, but some of the things that I think are exciting are um, the ability of satellites to communicate directly to cell phones. Now, I know um, Iridium and the Iridium phones have been a thing for a while, but directing, connecting directly to existing consumer electronics without modification, your iPhone, um, is happening. And so they're essentially showing, um, there are multiple companies now who are starting to show that you can actually take the technology that are normal cell towers on the ground and put them in low Earth orbit and they will work with your phone. And so we have some search and rescue signals and partnerships between um, companies um, like Apple Global Star and there are a few other companies that are working in this space to do direct to cell phone. Um, I think that's going to be really interesting um, as, as, as time evolves, um, especially as we have more autonomous vehicles and people are, you know, needing entertainment and data in, in different places because they, they have more time to use it. Um, I think also on orbit, uh, getting to the point where we have more compute on orbit. Right now, satellites mostly are run by um, not very sophisticated computers. Um, they're, they're getting better, um, and they're starting to use more commercial technology, more of the um, NVIDIA chips and AMD chips on orbit. Um, but when we're developing, it's really hard to only just take pictures and then send them all down to the ground. So you have a lot of data that in the normal mode of operations, you take a lot of data and you communicate it by radio, usually because of weather, all down to the ground, and then you process it on the ground. And then you tell your satellites what to do next. So there's a cycle of getting data down to the ground. And it's hard to get data down to the ground. Um, getting frequency licenses is difficult. It's expensive, requires a lot of management, um, requires a lot of power on board. Um, so putting computers on board that can survive on board and running now some of the new AI models so you can take the picture on board, you have a model that can decide whether or not what you wanted in the picture is in the picture. If it's in the picture, it prioritizes it. If it's not in the picture, it throws it out. If it's a cloudy picture, it throws it out and saves only the things you really wanted and then sends it back down. Um, also getting the satellites to communicate between each other so that they can tell each other, hey, I finished this task. 
here's the next in the task list passed back to you, kind of like playing tag, instead of waiting for that satellite to tell the ground and the ground to tell everybody what the new plan is. So being able to replan, retask, um, and to be able to make decisions about what is good and bad data dynamically will be new and exciting. One of the things Professor Cowhoy and her team of grad students is working on is a sort of robot that can be launched into orbit and then assemble satellites in space to avoid the rough and tumble of the launch itself. All right, so, um, so this is a project that's called Orbital Locker. Um, <laughs> one of the challenges about space is that you have to get everything to orbit, and to get to orbit it has to go on a rocket. And rockets are <laughs> very vibrating, dynamic, loud. They shake everything a lot. So during the launch. During the launch, yeah. It's for those first couple, it's only a couple minutes, but they're very important minutes. Um, and so everything we do about satellites, we pack them in tight, we glue everything down, everything's tied down, latched down, you know, locked in, so that nothing breaks. Um, and, most of the time, um, when it's going up in the rocket. Um, and then when we get to orbit, the you know, fairing opens, we get to orbit, the satellite's deployed, it's in orbit, the solar panels will unfurl. Um, but you basically have the thing you built on the ground. Um, what we were thinking is, wouldn't it be great if you could put a platform in orbit that was packed with things that don't break when they're on a rocket, so very simple components that you can just stow away. And you have these kind of robust robots that can unpack it themselves, but then they can build whatever they want. Once they get up on orbit, there's no shaking. Once you're on orbit, it's very quiet. So you it's a to, kit. Yeah, it's like a kit. It's a kit where the only thing that has to survive the rocket launch are these um, X, Y, Z, so three axis robots that move around and an arm that snaps everything together. And um, as long as these elements are robust enough to not get destroyed or damaged in the launch, um, you can go up to orbit and build something as big as you want. But you have to program in advance what the robot has to do, assemble in what order and things, right? Yes, so there's a lot of algorithm work and software work and that, but the nice part about this is the platform on orbit you can still talk to. You can reprogram things on orbit. You can give it different directions if you want to. You just need to make sure you kind of know what's in your warehouse. So it's kind of like almost a, a, a warehouse of hardware that you could use on orbit to assemble things and deploy them and make them as big and as complicated as you want without having to fit in the, you know, the couple meters. Um, I think you know, if we get Starship up to six meters um, of space that you have in a rocket, you could go well, well beyond that and not have to pre-plan everything to unfurl and deploy you could just build it the way you wanted it, as big as you wanted, um, once you get up there. Is this a prototype? Has this actually been this used? This is a prototype. So this, this has been used, um, so this recently in May, it was on a zero gravity launch. So the graduate students, James and Lila, who are working on it, took it on one of those um, planes that do the parabolic flights. Yeah. And so you have microgravity for you know a few seconds, 30 seconds at a time. And so they had the robot working there, and they, they actually um, learned a lot about cord management, so wires don't behave. <laughs> this, they don't lay down like, like this when they're in gravity, like they're kind of held down, but when they're on orbit, they move around a lot more. And so we had to um, update our wire management systems. Um, and then we'd like to get this to be a prototype on orbit um, on the space station, so it could be inside the station and we could start to demonstrate it, or on a free flyer on its own satellite um, later. So that's, that's kind of what we're hoping. That does it for us here at Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. See you next week for more stories of capitalism.